During the year of 2023, I made two trips to Kings Mountain Military Park, not to be confused with Kings Mountain State Park. The first trip was during the summer with Ayana and the boys, whereas the second trip was during the fall with my husband and the boys. The latter visit was during the wreath laying ceremony. This event occurs annually and corresponds with the battle's anniversary and the Frederick Hambright family reunion. During this vlog, I will show both trips and the Hambright reunion. In addition, I will discuss the history of the park, South Carolina events that led to the Battle of Kings Mountain, details about the battle, information about Frederick Hambright, and our connection to him. The Kings Mountain National Military Park is one of the two Revolutionary War battlefields located in Cherokee County, South Carolina. This park was established in 1933 to commemorate the Revolutionary War Southern Campaign and to celebrate the battle that turned the tide in establishing Patriot victory. One of the must-dos while visiting the park is hiking the battlefield trail. The 1.5-mile paved path goes by several points of interest. Some of these stops include the Chronicle Marker, two monuments on top of King's Mountain, Ferguson's Grave, and the Frederick Hambright Marker. The Chronicle Marker is considered the earliest commemorative work in King's Mountain as well as the second oldest Revolutionary War monument in the country. The old Chronicle marker was erected by Dr. William McLean of Lincoln County, North Carolina at his own expense on July 4th of 1815. As a Revolutionary War veteran, he did this while running for Congress to bring attention and honor his fallen comrades. The old chronicle marker is a 3.5 foot tall, thumb-shaped slate stone. It marks the location where Patriots Major William Chronicle, Captain John Maddox, William Rabb, and John Boyd died, as well as the British commander Patrick Ferguson. Unfortunately, the original inscription has been worn over time and is no longer legible. However, a companion monument known as the New or 1914 Chronicle Marker was raised immediately to the right of the marker to preserve the eroding text. In 1879, the citizens of York, South Carolina and Kings Mountain, North Carolina decided to erect a monument on Kings Mountain for the centennial celebration. By July 25, 1879, they had collected $2,500 and Colonel Ashbury Coward was elected as president over the Kings Mountain Centennial Association. The purpose of the association was to plan the 1880 celebration for the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Kings Mountain. By the year of the centennial celebration, the association had purchased 39 acres of the battlefield and had a 28-foot granite monument constructed. During this monument's construction, the Masonic Lodge laid the first cornerstone. The monument was also placed in the location of where the most intense fighting occurred. During the celebration, the monument commemorated the reversal of Patriot losses during the Southern Campaign. In addition, during the celebration, four young women of South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia stood at the monument as representatives of the patriots from their states that fought upon the mountain. Also, 13 colonial flags were displayed, and that night, fireworks illuminated the mountain. For the 1909 celebration, an 83-foot national monument was built to honor the men who fought here. Interestingly, the National Monument was designed by the same New York firm that designed the original Madison Square Garden and Penn Station. This monument was constructed of white granite from Mount Airy, North Carolina. In addition, for the 1909 celebration, the Kings Mountain Daughters of the American Revolution organized the monument dedication, 
which included governors from South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, as well as militia groups from these states that reenacted the battle. The 1909 monument is the largest monument in the park, and besides honoring those who fought here, it marks the place of Ferguson's camp and the site of surrender. The Colonel Frederick Hambright Memorial was dedicated on October the 7th of 1931 after the dedication of a memorial to Colonel A. Coward and a picnic lunch on the 151st anniversary of the battle. During the dedication, a speech was given by Dr. Delia Dixon Carroll of Raleigh, North Carolina, who said, it was a brave band of mountaineers who not only turned the tides against the British hold on America, but who showed Washington and his troops how to fight and win in the wilderness. The Patrick Ferguson marker was placed in the 1920s by the U.S. government to mark Ferguson's gravesite. To some, Ferguson was a fierce adversary, but to his comrades, he was revered for his intelligence, humor, and charm. Prior to the October 7, 1780 Battle of Kings Mountain, much had already occurred in South Carolina. For example, in South Carolina on December the 9th of 1773, the Charleston Tea Party transpired eight days prior to the famous one in Boston. After the 1776 war began, initially most of the battles were northern affairs. However, as the war raged on, here in the South, tensions finally gave way to a bloody civil war, during which families and neighbors turned on each other in their support of either the crown or of liberty. As a result, opposing militia groups fought in the following South Carolina battles. The 1775 Snow Campaign and Battle of Great Cane. The 1776 Battle of Sullivan's Island and Battle of Lindley's. Followed by the 1779 Battle of Beaufort and the Battle of Stono Ferry. By 1780, British General Clinton had set his sights on the South and brought with him the British Regular Army to wreak havoc. In the low country of South Carolina resided some fierce patriot leaders. Regardless, on May 12th of 1780, America suffered its worst defeat as Charleston fell under British control. After the fall of Charleston, Cornwallis was placed in charge of the Southern Campaign. However, this would be the undoing of British support in the South. This is because the British believed to show power they needed to oppress the Southern people. This was done by Cornwallis's men, the bulldog Patrick Ferguson, bloody Bannister Tarleton, and later the turncoat loyalist, Scout Bloody Bill Cunningham. However, the brutal tactics used by these men proved only to have the opposite effect, causing people to switch alliances and get those not wanting to be involved to take a stand. Leading up to the Battle of Kings Mountain, the following battles took place in South Carolina in 1780. The Battle of Linnude's Ferry, Battle of the Waxhaws, Battle of Mobley's Meeting House, Huck's Defeat, Battle of Rocky Mountain, Battle of Hanging Rock, Battle of Camden, Battle of Fishing's Creek, Battle of Musgrove Mills, Battle of Black Mingo, and the Battle of Wahab's Plantation not to mention all of the skirmishes that occurred, as well as the skirmishes and battles that occurred in the nearby state of North Carolina. Of the South Carolina battles, Tarleton's actions at the Battle of the Waxhaws, which included allowing his men to kill Americans who had already surrendered, would spur on the need for a patriot victory and the actions that would occur on October the 7th. Upon arriving to Kings Mountain, Major Patrick Ferguson and his 1,100 men set up their white canvas tents on top of the mountain. While encamped, Ferguson waited on his furloughed militia to return, as well as reinforcements. 
There is also evidence that suggests while on top of the mountain, Ferguson may have been having intimate relations with a red-headed beauty named Virginia Soul. Regardless of Ferguson's reputation for having many Patriot women killed during the war, it is believed he may have been a womanizer. Ferguson was found to have had many affairs with several women, the most notable of his lovers being the previously mentioned Virginia Soul, a woman by the name of Featherstone, and a woman by the name of Virginia Pole. In fact, both Virginias were recorded as being here within Ferguson's camp at the same time. So confident was Ferguson during this time that he proclaimed, I am on top of King's Mountain, and I am king of this mountain. All of the rebels in hell can't drive me from it. Interestingly, no British regulars fought here under Ferguson. All of his men were militia. Some of his men were truly loyal to the crown, others seeking vengeance, and others even pressed into service. Unknowingly to Ferguson and his militia, 900 militia patriots surrounded them at the base of the mountain. These patriot militiamen fought within one of the eight detachments under Shelby, Williams, Lacey, Campbell, Severe, McDowell, Winston, or our man Frederick Hambright. Sensing the impending battle, the Patriot commanders told their men, Don't wait for a word of command. Let each of you be your own officer and do the very best you can. Of these commanders, Joseph Winston led a group from Surrey, now Stokes County, North Carolina. Earlier, they had joined forces with Chronicle and McDowell. Together, these patriots and their men held the critical position of blocking Ferguson's retreat to Cornwallis. While at King's Mountain, Winston commanded 60 men. So heroic was Winston during the battle that in 1815, along with most of all of the other commanders, he was awarded a sword by the North Carolina legislature for his valor. Upon receiving the sword, Winston stated, I am at a loss for words to accept this honor. May the sword never be tarnished by cowardice, but always wielded in defense of my country's rights and liberty. On top of the mountain, near 3 p.m., Loyalist officer Alexander Chesney dismounted his horse. He was just about to report to Ferguson that all was quiet and the pickets on alert, when suddenly the sound of gunfire rang out about a half a mile away. After this shot, leader of the Patriot Virginia Militia, Campbell, announced, Here they are. Fight like hell and shout like devils. The order was followed by the Patriots sounding off with a loud and eerie war cry. As the screaming Patriots charged up the hill, the Dutch-American loyalist Captain Abraham de Pasture turned to Major Ferguson and said, These things are ominous, these damned yelling boys. Chesney and the other loyalist atop the hill then came to realize the Patriots were everywhere and actually quite close. According to Chesney, the fight rapidly ensued, and according to another soldier, the mountain appeared volcanic, as one long sulfurous blaze fired upon it. In addition, later, one loyalist recalled the over-the-mountain men as, They appeared like devils from the infernal regions, tall, raw bone, sinewy with long matted hair. However, much of the militia on both sides looked the same. In fact, in some cases, the only difference in appearance was that of the loyalist twig or the patriot white paper or fabric worn in one's hat. Unfortunately, during the onset of the battle, Colonel Benjamin Cleveland and his men from Wilkes County were not in position and still fighting the soggy and deep mud on their side of the mountain. When shots rang out, their struggle intensified as they came under heavy fire. 
During this time, Cleveland pointed to the summit and yelled, Yonder is your enemy and the enemy of mankind. When Cleveland and his men finally arrived to their assigned spot at the base of the mountain, Cleveland rode by his line of men saying, My brave fellows, we have beaten them and we can do it again. My brave men, they are cowards. If they had the spirit of men, they would join us in the cause of independence for their country. Upon Cleveland and his militiamen moving up the mountain because of continual fire, they had to use trees, brush, and rocks as cover. During this time, Cleveland continued to encourage his men by shouting, A little nearer to them, my brave men. When Officer Charles Gordon finally reached the summit, he found himself in the midst of enemy officers. At this, Gordon grabbed hold to a braid of hair on the opposite facing man and began to pull him down the mountain. As Gordon was doing so, he was shot in the arm, shattering his arm's bone. Simultaneously, Gordon was able to run the loyalist through with his sword he held in his opposing hand. While making his way up the mountain with his men, Lieutenant Samuel Johnson was shot in the abdomen. The shot demobilized Johnson, but during the battle he kept the morale of his men high by repeatedly raising his hands and shouting, Huzzah, boys, huzzah! During the thickest of the fight, Colonel James Williams fiercely led his 60 North Carolina and South Carolina men. Williams had already made a reputation for himself as a brave fighter during the Florida campaign, the Battle of Briars Creek, the Battle of Savannah, the Battle of Stono Ferry, and the Battle of Musgrove Mills. In fact, at Musgrove Mills, Williams' expert leadership resulted in his men experiencing minimal losses. During this battle, the brave Colonel Williams charged on his horse up the mountain at full speed. Upon coming under heavy fire, Williams' horse halted and began to stomp at the ground, after which William quickly threw down the reins and dismounted. It is still unknown who shot Colonel Williams. However, some say it was Ferguson himself. Fortunately, Williams did live long enough to witness the victory, at which time Williams said, I die content as we have gained victory. One of the patriots who witnessed Williams' heroism was later recorded as saying, A braver man never died on the battlefield. As 16-year-old Robert Henry made his way up the mountain, while cocking his gun, he came into close combat with the enemy. During this encounter, the enemy's bayonet slid down Robert's rifle and dug deep into his hand. Luckily, Roberts was able to release his shot and kill this enemy. However, to push out the deep bayonet that impaled his hand, he had to use his foot. During the fray, Chronicle and his Lincoln County, North Carolina militia was hit with a volley of enemy fire, after which Major Chronicle, Captain John Maddox, William Rabb, and John Boyd were mortally wounded. This shocking loss of patriot leadership caused Colonel Frederick Hambright to take command of Chronicle's militia. Upon the continual assault of the mountain, Hambright was shot in the thigh and his boot began to fill with blood. When one of his men noticed this, they encouraged Hambright to dismount. However, Hambright refused, as he believed that doing so would take his men's attention off of the battle. While almost cresting the mountain, Joseph McDowell Burke and his Rutherford militia found the tips of the enemy's bayonets. This caused them to escape the bayonet charge by retreating back down the mountain to where today Ferguson's marker stands. Luckily, none of Burke's men met their end during this bayonet charge. 
While the bitter fight continued, some were confronted with having to fight their own neighbors and family. Such was the case of Thomas Robertson, who, while taking cover behind a large tree, heard a familiar voice cry his name. Upon peering from the safety of his cover, a bullet aimed for Thomas's head struck the tree and removed some of the bark. Instinctively, Thomas returned fire only to wound his loyalist neighbor, Lafferty. After this realization, Thomas rushed to the side of Lafferty, whose last words were, Robertson, Robertson, you have ruined me. May the devil help you. In the case of a loyalist named Branson, as he lay mortally wounded, he called out and reached up for his patriot brother-in-law. However, Branson was met with the words, Look to your friends for help. Interestingly, upon hearing what was said to Branson, his sister left her patriot husband. While under the command of Captain Desart, Virginia militiaman Leonard Heiss fell dreadfully wounded. He had already taken two bullets to the left arm. He recounted his later experience as follows. We were fighting in the woods. I shot three rounds before I was shot down. I then received a bullet to my left leg. The fourth bullet I received to my right knee, which shattered the bone in my right thigh, and brought me to the ground. When on the ground, I received a bullet to my breast and was borne off the ground to a doctor. After one hour and five minutes of battle, Lieutenant Anthony Allaire, a New York loyalist in Ferguson's command, found himself and his men thrown into confusion as they were surrounded by patriots. After the battle, Anthony was recorded as saying, Our poor little detachment, which consisted of only 70 men, when we marched to the battlefield of action, were all killed and wounded. In fact, at this time, loyalist casualties were so heavy, Ferguson's officers began pleading with him to surrender. One of Ferguson's militia groups had already found themselves without ammunition. However, upon raising the flag of truce, Ferguson galloped towards the flag and that of another white flag and chopped them both down with his sword. Ferguson then rode back and forth, blowing his silver whistle that he used to signal charges. Upon seeing Campbell and Shelby's Patriot militia breaking through, Ferguson shouted out, Hurrah, brave boys, the day is ours. Admits the emerging Patriot forces, Ferguson, refusing to find himself in the hands of such rabble, took a few officers and lunged their horses down the mountain, slashing and cutting as they made their way. In fact, in doing so, Ferguson used his sword so viciously against the Patriots that it broke. Mounted on his horse, Ferguson proved the perfect target for his crack-shot opponents. In a final act of defiance, Ferguson shot and killed a man with his pistol, after which Seaver's men fired a volley, and Ferguson was shot and dragged by his horse behind the Patriot lines. Upon Ferguson's death, Captain de Peaster gained command and sent out an emissary with a white flag asking for quarter. For several minutes, the Patriots rejected the white flag and continued firing, many of them shouting, Give them Tarleton's quarter! Give them Buford's play! Unfortunately, a significant number of surrendering loyalists were killed or wounded, just as the Patriots had been at the Battle of the Waxhaws. During the last moments of the battle, Patriot Andrew Cresswell was able to get so close to the enemy, he was able to see the smoke from their guns. Andrew stated, After firing, I ran without halt till I came to the center of their encampment, at which moment a flag was raised for quarter, the enemy on my left. Campbell maneuvered ahead of his men and climbed over a steep rock where he noticed the enemy retreating. 
Patriot Robert Campbell, who witnessed this, stated, As soon as it was observed that Colonel Ferguson was killed, Ferguson's captain raised the flag and called for quarter. It was soon taken out of his hand by one of the officers on horseback and raised so high that it could be seen by our line. The loyalists at the time of surrender were driven into a crowd, after which Campbell and Seaver ran forward and took control by ordering their men to cease fire. Around this time, Shelby ordered the enemy, Throw down your arms and surrender yourself as prisoners. When the Patriots recovered Ferguson's corpse, they counted seven bullet wounds, one being a headshot. He was also described as having two broken arms and his clothing being shot to shreds. Upon his burial, he was wrapped in a cow's hide and stones placed upon his grave. This was done as a Scots-Irish belief that it would keep him from rising from the dead. Interestingly, the red-headed camp maiden, Virginia Saul's lifeless body was recovered and placed beside Ferguson. In the aftermath of the battle, there were 58 wounded and 29 dead patriots, and 163 wounded and 250 dead American British sympathizers. In addition, almost 700 Loyalist militia were taken prisoner. In fact, the great death toll made the burial of these men very difficult. Many ended up in shallow and mass graves. To the horror of many locals, they noticed a drastic increase in size of the pig population after the battle. Obviously, this was contributed to the new source of food the hogs were able to easily root up. As a result, many refused to eat these pigs for as long as possible. On a more positive note, in the Battle of Kings Mountain, of those brave men who fought, we may be related to John Palmer, William Johnson, James Knox, and of course, Frederick Hambright. Frederick Hambright was born on May 17th of 1727 in Moosebach, Bavaria, then part of the Holy Roman Empire in present-day Germany. Frederick was the son of Johann Conrad Hambright and Anna Barbara, and the grandson of Hans Wilhelm Humbrock. On October 27, 1738, at the age of 11, Frederick, his parents, and brothers sailed to Philadelphia aboard the ship St. Andrews. Eventually, Frederick and his family ended up settling in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. In some sources, it appears that Frederick's father, Johann, may have left Frederick in Pennsylvania while he went to establish a homestead in North Carolina. Frederick's father may have done this due to the dangers of the North Carolina frontier at the time, or so Frederick could continue to obtain a sound education that he would need to use later in his life. Unfortunately, on December the 20th of 1738, Frederick lost his absent father at the age of 49. Frederick's father, Johann, was buried in Tryon, Polk, North Carolina. Sometime after his death, Frederick eventually too traveled south, stopping in Virginia on his way to the Carolinas. Some sources state that Frederick may have been 18 when he stopped in Henrico County, Virginia. While in Virginia, on his way to North Carolina, or upon arriving in North Carolina, Frederick became close with Sarah Hardin. Sarah was born in 1730 in Richmond, Virginia, and was the daughter of Sarah Elizabeth Hopper and James Harden II of Virginia. In some sources, Sarah lost her mother, Sarah Elizabeth Hopper Harden, only six years after her birth. 
While the true location of Sarah's mother, Sarah Elizabeth Harden's burial, is unknown, some believe that she may be buried in Lincoln, North Carolina. However, this would mean, for some reason, Sarah's mother left her family, or that Sarah's family was already in North Carolina at the time of her death. Interestingly, Benjamin Harden II's son and Sarah's brother, Joseph Harden, was also a high-ranking officer during the Revolutionary War. In addition, Joseph Harden was a signer of the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence and later a original trustee at Greenville College. So respected was Joseph Harden that Hardin County in Tennessee was named in his honor. Regardless of Sarah's whereabouts, it is believed the young Frederick Hambright married Sarah Harden between 1750 and 1753. It is also stated in some sources Frederick and Sarah, along with a group of several neighbors, which included Sarah's brothers, Joseph, John, and Benjamin, traveled to the Carolinas together. However, it is also possible that Sarah and her family were already in North Carolina and only purchased land in the 1750s. Upon arriving to North Carolina, Frederick and the other pioneers erected log cabins and joined with neighbors in building a fort for protection against the Catawba Indians. As Hambright became immersed in the American melting pot, he took part in battles against the Indians. On August 30th of 1753, Frederick received a grant for 300 acres of the South Fork of the Catawba River. During the year of 1755, Sarah and Frederick welcomed their first daughter, Elizabeth Hambright, later Jenkins. By 1762, Sarah gave birth to Frederick's son, John Harden Hambright. Then, in 1764, Sarah lost her father, Benjamin, at the age of 65. It is believed that he was buried somewhere in Mecklenburg, North Carolina. As a result, Sarah probably named her second son, which she had that year in Benjamin Hambra in his honor. In 1766, they had their fourth child, Frederick Hambra Jr. In 1768, they welcomed baby Sarah Hambra. While growing his family, Frederick was also purchasing additional lands. In May of 1769, Frederick purchased lands in the Fork of Long Creek and Stillhouse Branch near present-day Dallas, North Carolina, which is part of Gaston County. On August 14th of 1775, Frederick, along with others, signed the Tryon Resolves a document which declared that the signers would vow resistance against the British for their actions at the Battle of Lexington. In addition, between August the 20th and September the 10th of 1775, Frederick was also a representative of Tryon County at the Third Provisional Congress. On September the 9th of 1755, Frederick served as a major under Colonel William Graham in the Tryon County, North Carolina Regiment. In late 1776, Hambright took part in the Rutherford Light Horse Expedition against the Overhill Cherokee. During this time, Frederick earned the rank of captain. When the Revolutionary War finally reached Tryon County in 1777, Hambright joined the fight for independence. Hambright was given the rank of Lieutenant Colonel of the Lincoln County Regiment, a regiment that was locally known as the South Fork Boys. During the war, Hambright served as a military officer who fought in both local militia and the North Carolina line of the Continental Army. Regardless of the war, in 1778, Sarah conceived and gave birth to Frederick's son, James M. Hambright. 
The following year, in 1779, Frederick served as a lieutenant colonel of riflemen under Colonel Andrew Hampton in the Rutherford County Regiment. Some evidence suggests that Frederick may have been at the June 20th, 1779 Battle of Stono's Ferry near Charleston, South Carolina, as the North Carolina militia was there. While this battle started out well for the Patriots, it ended badly, resulting in a Patriot loss in which 34 were killed, 113 wounded, and 155 went missing. On June 20th of 1780, it is believed that Frederick may have been at the Battle of Ramsier Mills in North Carolina under Colonel Francis Locke of Rowan County Regiment. This battle was most brutal because of the lack of ammunition, leading many to use their muskets as clubs. This Patriot victory led to several loyalists being imprisoned and their property being seized. The casualties of this battle were very hard to assign as almost no one was wearing any sort of identification. However, it is estimated that each side suffered about a 100 wounded and about 70 dead. In addition, many bodies laid scattered over the hill, and in the aftermath, much of the dead were buried by their grieving wives, mothers, and children. During the Revolutionary War, Hambright's brave actions earned him the nickname, the Terror of the Tories. Unfortunately, while Frederick was fighting the noble fight for independence, on July 17th of 1780, his wife, Sarah Harden, passed away at the age of 46 of an unknown cause. During their marriage, Frederick and Sarah had 12 children, of which six died in infancy. Sarah was laid to rest in what was described as a family plot, later known as the Hambright Jenkins Cemetery in Dallas, North Carolina, perhaps near her lost children. Originally, the location did have several stones as markers. As of today, the cemetery belongs to Gaston County, and somehow the rocks have disappeared. After Sarah's death, Frederick moved and built a small cabin near the area where he would fight his last battle. Prior to the Battle of King's Mountain, Colonel William Graham, the commander of Frederick's militia group, was absent due to illness in his family. Thus, Frederick took command of the group. The group was positioned at the ball base beside the hill of the mountain a position that was suited to attack the main loyalist. The objective of the day was to catch the loyalist by surprise. Near the end of the battle, the 53-year-old Frederick Hambright had already received three bullets through his hat and a shot through his thigh, which cut through some arteries. While bleeding badly, he refused to dismount and continued fighting. In fact, he continued to encourage his men by calling out in his German accent, Huzzah, my brave boys! Fight only a few minutes more and the battle will be over. It is said that Major Patrick Ferguson, the British commander, was so near that he responded with, Huzzah, brave boys! The day is our own! These were to be among Ferguson's last words before being shot to death. Later, a fellow soldier, Samuel Moore, would say the following about Frederick Hambright. He knew he was wounded, but not sick or faint from the loss of blood. He said he could still ride very well, and therefore deemed it his duty to fight on till the battle was over. After the battle, Hambright was taken to his nearby log cabin to recover. Unfortunately, in addition to being badly wounded, he also had no wife to care for him. However, the young Mary Dover, the daughter of Frederick's neighbor, decided to come and care for him. After recuperating, Frederick found himself with a permanent limp, that resulted in ending his military career.
Interestingly, during Frederick's recovery, he found himself infatuated with his young nurse. In February of 1781, the North Carolina General Assembly presented to each senior officer that served in the Battle of Kings Mountain a elegantly mounted sword. However, because of unknown circumstances, Hambright did not receive his sword. During this year, on July 17th of 1781, Frederick married the 18-year-old Mary Dover. The wedding took place in York County, South Carolina, at the home of Frederick's neighbor and friend, Arthur Patterson Sr. As Frederick began to father more children with his second wife, he built a two-story weatherboard log house near the site of his log cabin and the historical battlefield. During Frederick and Mary's marriage together, they had ten children, eight living to maturity. These children included Henry, David, Mary Polly, Susan Sophia, Josiah, Charlotte, Abner, Susan, and Susanna. On a website other than the official Frederick Hambright site, I also came upon a Mary and Frederick, whose children included all of the previously mentioned names, as well as a son, James, son, Harry, and son Fred. In addition, this list also contained the names of the enslaved people Jacob, Eve, Prince, Susan, Adam, and Isaac, who were listed as living with the Hambright household. Although I am not sure this is the same Frederick and Mary Hambright, it is written that Frederick lived a quiet life on his homestead near King's Mountain with his family until his death on March 9, 1817, at the age of 90. Frederick was buried in the old Shiloh Presbyterian Church Cemetery where Frederick had been an elder. A location not far from the King's Mountain Military Park boundary. In addition, Frederick's tombstone was inscribed as follows. Colonel Frederick Hambright, born 1727 in Germany, died 1817 in York County, South Carolina, migrated to Pennsylvania in 1738, moved to Tron County, North Carolina before 1750, a true patriot. He rendered notable civil and military service for a cause of freedom. Upon Mary Dover Hambright's death on May 5th, 1835, she may have been buried at Frederick's side in the cemetery located in Cleveland County, one mile east of Grover, North Carolina. However, as she has no marker, it is more likely that she is buried in Tennessee. As it is told, she moved with one of her sons to Tennessee after Frederick's death. While Frederick did not receive a sword, in more recent times, the North Carolina General Assembly finally honored Frederick Hambright by presenting his descendants with an over-the-mountain men replica pistol. The presentation was made at the battlegrounds on October the 7th of 1980 for the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Kings Mountain after which the Frederick Hambright family decided to donate the pistol to the Cleveland County Museum in Shelby, North Carolina. In addition, while at Kings Mountain Military Park, besides visiting the Hambright plaque, you can see Frederick Hambright's personal sword that he used throughout his military career as it is displayed within the park's museum. Before I continue with our connection to Frederick Hambright, I would like to acknowledge that in several past videos, I have wrongly stated that Sarah Ann Hambright Peeler was the daughter of Frederick Hambright. However, in reality, she was the great-granddaughter. 
In this vlog, I hope to make our connection to Frederick Hambright more clear. We are connected to Frederick and Sarah Harden Hambright by their son, Frederick Hambright Jr., who was born in 1776. It is also rumored that Frederick Hambright Jr. fought during the Battle of Kings Mountain. This would have made him 14 years old at the time. However, due to the lack of evidence, later in time, Frederick Hambright Jr.'s wife, Mary, was denied his pension. Frederick Hambright Jr.'s home was also in York, South Carolina, at the Cleveland County line near his father on Kings Creek. Jr. was also an Indian fighter and made at least one expedition to Georgia, where it is believed he earned the rank of major. On November 3, 1787, in Lincoln, North Carolina, Frederick Jr. married Mary Ecker. Many years later, on February 15, 1829, John Stewart and George Wisnut had Frederick Jr. removed from the Shiloh Church for intoxication. In March of that year, Jr. was given the opportunity to defend himself and rejoin the church. However, it appears he did not show up for the meeting. During Mary and Jr.'s marriage, they had several children, including John, Peter, James, Michael, Benjamin, Sally, Jefferson, and Madison. Frederick Jr.'s wife, Mary, passed on November the 15th, 1832, at the age of 59 in Cleveland County, North Carolina. Frederick Jr. died on August the 1st, 1844, at about the age of 78. Jr. was buried along with his father at the Shiloh Presbyterian Church Cemetery. Our lineage then goes from Frederick Jr. and Mary Hambright to their son, Madison Hambright. Madison was born in 1811 in York County. He was a farmer, and around 1835, Madison married Elizabeth Manning. While married to Elizabeth, Madison fathered the following children, Robert, Sarah Ann, John Pinckney, Mary A., Arteza, and James Kirk. When Madison's wife Elizabeth passed in 1848, she was buried in the Old Shiloh Cemetery. In 1857, Madison then remarried Faithy Hauser. Together, they had two sons, Henry and Harvey. It is also during the 1850s that it was said Madison was a very wealthy man. Madison passed away on August 8, 1857, probably in Cleveland County, North Carolina, and he was also buried in the Old Shiloh Cemetery with his first wife, his father, and his grandfather. After Madison passed, his second wife, Faithy Hauser Hambright, did remarry to William J. Wilson. They had a son named William T. Wilson. It is unconfirmed, but it is believed that William adopted Madison's sons, and they may have changed their last names. In 1918, Madison's second wife passed. From Madison and Elizabeth Hambright, we come from their daughter, Sarah Ann Hambright. Sarah married John Rufus Peeler, the second child of seven children. J.R. was born on April 15, 1833, to Anthony and Mary Ann Lockhart Peeler. Like Sarah, J.R. also came from a long line of farmers who settled in the frontier backcountry of South Carolina and fought Indians and hard times to establish a homestead. In fact, J.R. himself was a farmer and a part-time schoolteacher. Sometime prior to 1860, J.R. married Sarah Ann Hambright and they had one child together, James Madison Peeler. J.R. was 28 years old when the war between the states started in 1861. He and his younger brothers, Daniel Marion, J. Newton, 
David Smith and Anthony Jasper enlisted on August 29, 1861 in Company F, 15th South Carolina Infantry. During the war, J.R. lost a finger and after that was listed as a teamster for the quartermaster. His war records show that like many other southern soldiers, he had to return home without leave from May until July of 1864 to help plant crops and then return to his unit. J.R. fought through the entire war and served under General Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and served under General Joseph E. Johnston. J.R. was even there when they were forced to surrender to General Sherman in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1865. J.R. was paroled on May 2nd of 1865 and returned home to continue farming and teaching. His war record also shows that he fought until the bitter end from 1861 to 1865. In 1780, Sarah Ann Hambright Peeler passed away and was buried at the number one Peeler Cemetery near Gaffney, South Carolina. James Madison Peeler, their only child, was only nine years old. Eventually, sometime prior to 1877, J.R. did remarry a second time to Martha Blackwell, daughter of William Blackwell. Together, J.R. and Martha parented the following nine children, Mary, Leela, Christopher Columbus, John Anthony, Erskine Boyce, Rufus S., Isla, Elizabeth, Lavisi, and Cora. At his death, J.R. was living in the Wilkinsville area close to his son, James Madison. J.R. was a member of Smyrna ARP Church and a highly respected citizen in his state and community. J.R. had walked to the nearby store in Wilkinsville and then walked home, where he sat down in his chair and passed away from a heart attack. He was buried next to his sister, Mary Ann Christine Peeler Patrick, in the Old Patrick Cemetery. Later, his second wife, Martha, also called Maddie, passed away at age 77 and she was buried at Abington Creek Cemetery. Next in our lineage is J.R. and Sarah Ann Hambright Peeler's son, James Madison. James Madison was a Cherokee County farmer and a highly respected man. He married Christina Martin, and together they had 16 children, two of which died within the first years of life. These children included James Thomas, Jasper Smith, John Rufus, Maddie May, Hattie Leela, Aura Ann, Marion Anthony, Pearl Edna, Roy Lee, Theresa Olive, Grady Frank, Vera, Ernest Andrew, Zula Eunice, and Ethel Lucille. In 1925, Christina Martin Peeler passed first at the age of 56. James Madison would pass away at age 76 in 1937. They were laid to rest beside each other at the Patrick Family Burial Ground. Of James Madison and Christina Martin Peeler's children, we are related by Leroy Peeler who later changed his name legally to Roy Lee Peeler. He was their ninth child, born in 1897. Roy Lee, who was also a farmer, had an unfortunate accident in which he injured himself when he was younger by falling from a tree. As a result, he lost much of his mobility and was unable to work as he once had. However, he did help supervise many farming endeavors for the family. During his life, Roy Lee married Millie Cora Kennedy. Together, they had nine children. Unfortunately, in 1955, Roy passed at the age of 58, 
from a heart attack. Later in 1984, at the age of 83, Cora also passed away. Today, Roy and Cora can be found buried beside each other at Frederick Memorial Gardens in Gaffney, South Carolina. Our lineage then goes from Roy and Cora Kennedy Peeler to their first son who was born in 1918 and was named Pierce Anthony, more commonly referred to as P.A. P.A. was a pastor. And as an adult, he married the kind-hearted Maybell Bratton. Together, they had four sons. After Maybell's untimely and unsettling passing at the age of 57 in 1975, P.A. went on to finally remarry a woman by the last name of Calvert. P.A. passed away in 2003 at the age of 84 and was laid to rest beside his first wife at Frederick Memorial Gardens. Finally, the last relative I will discuss is Roy and Cora's son, Clarence Peeler. As a young man, Clarence married Veronica Vicky Scoggins. Together, they had two children. After Clarence and Vicky's divorce, they both eventually remarried. Clarence went on to live in the states of Florida, Maryland, and North Carolina before moving back to South Carolina. Vicky passed away and was cremated in 2012. As of today, her ashes are being stored at the home of her daughter, Dina Peeler Upchurch, with the intention that her remains will be buried with one of her three children upon their passing. Of course, Clarence's grandchildren include myself, as well as Holly and Katie Peeler. If you are related to anyone who fought in the Battle of Kings Mountain, or anyone else that I spoke of today, I would love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, and as always, thanks for watching.